Hey crazies, I was thinking lately, I'm an astrophysicist, and I haven't done nearly enough astronomy videos. Imposter syndrome is probably partly to blame. Stop self-diagnosing, Nick. Anyway, we're gonna break this pattern right now. Our last video was on nuclear fusion, which usually happens in the cores of stars. So let's talk about stars. There is way too much about stars to cram into one video, so let's focus on a specific obstacle. How do we know anything about stars if they're so far away and live for millions of years? By being science ninjas. Hiya! Ninjas? Yeah, ninjas are cool. That doesn't have to make sense. So yes, stars are very far away, but they send out light that travels the distance for us. And that light tells us a lot. We need two pieces of information. The type of light, meaning its color, and the amount of light, meaning its brightness. Contrary to popular belief, color is not a property of matter. It's a property of light. For normal things like you, me, or question clone, our color depends on what light scatters off of us. Turn off the lights, and you don't see any color. Stars are different though. They make their own light, and the color of that light depends on the star's temperature. Let's take a look at the most familiar star in the sky, the sun. It's what we call a yellow-white dwarf, meaning its color is yellowish-white, and its size is modest by star standards. Or you might say, standards? Eh? That yellowish white color is on its chromosphere, meaning color sphere, which has a temperature of about 5,800 Kelvin. Let's be clear though, anything with a temperature above absolute zero is making its own light. So basically everything. It just isn't always visible to human eyes. Whenever particles nudge each other, a little energy gets lost as light. What kind of light that is depends on how fast the particles are going. And since particle motion tends to be pretty random, objects with lots of particles emit lots of different kinds of light. The human body is around 310 Kelvin, so most of the light is infrared. But for a bright light bulb or the sun, there is a lot more visible light. But if it's losing energy, won't it cool down? If it were an inanimate object, yes. But it's not. The human body uses chemistry to replace that energy. After all, humans are just sacks of aqueous chemicals. A star, on the other hand, replaces any lost energy using nuclear fusion in its core. The temperature in the sun's core is 15 million Kelvin, which is like, so hot. Anyway, if you combine a star's brightness with its color, you get what we call an HR diagram. The sun is yellowish white, so it's right about here on the chart. But if we plot a bunch of stars on here at the same time, a pattern develops. These are the younger stars fusing hydrogen into helium. These are the older stars fusing helium into larger elements. And these are what are left over after small stars die. You can draw a star's entire life on this chart. So what's a year in the life of a star? Basically nothing. Big stars will live for millions of years. The sun will live for billions of years. And little red dwarfs can live for trillions of years. Stars age so slowly that we've only seen a few actually change. Then how do we know anything about their lives? Because of that HR diagram. We see patterns in this diagram and combine it with what we know about nuclear fusion and plasmas to figure out how old a star is. Then we put the different examples on a timeline to get a full picture. Oh, right, that's a great analogy. Imagine a group of aliens like Milton wanted to study the human lifespan, but they could only spend a few seconds here on Earth. They would show up, take a bunch of pictures, and leave working really hard to piece the pictures together later. That's exactly what we do with stars. Pretty crazy, huh? So, will you ever look at a star the same way again? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for liking and sharing this video. Don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to keep up with us. And until next time, remember, it's okay to be a little crazy. In the last video, we learned about nuclear fusion. Comment response time! Gaston was wondering, why don't we shape the tokamak reactor like an 8 instead of a circle? Wouldn't an 8 shape smash more together at the center? Well, maybe. But a circle's easier to make. Not just for the reactor itself, but also for the magnetic field. The reactor uses magnetic force to confine plasma. And plasma, like any other charged particle, just naturally travels in a circle in a magnetic field. It's already a huge challenge to confine the plasma in the first place. We don't need to make it any harder. Tezico was wondering how dangerous hydrogen fusion would be, and the answer is it's actually really safe. Sure, the first time we figured it out, we turned it into a bomb. But that's what happens when you let the military fund your project. 
Plus, you can turn most things that release energy into a bomb. So that doesn't really count as a complaint. You just have to put safeguards in place to prevent explosion, which is something we already do with our current sources of energy. The best part about a fusion, though, is it doesn't create any dangerous exhaust. It produces helium, which we're in dire need of anyway for cooling systems. We actually need the byproducts. Abu Sayed wanted to know about quantum tunneling during fusion. Okay, so I purposefully avoided this in the video. My videos are already information dense enough. Talking about quantum tunneling would just have distracted from what I was trying to say. But we'll talk about it here for a bit. Hydrogen fusion begins at 13 million Kelvin. It's just that on paper, if you only consider the motion of the protons, you need hundreds of times higher temperatures. So we're clearly missing something if we do that. If we also consider the protons as quantum particles, which is exactly what they are, then you don't actually have to break the Coulomb barrier. You just have to get the two protons close enough so that the uncertainties in their positions overlap. Dave Long asked how cosmic rays create things like lithium and beryllium. So yes, nuclear fusion skips over a few of the early elements on the periodic table. But fission can come back and make them later. Fusion is when you combine smaller elements to make larger ones. Fission is when you take larger elements and break them apart to make smaller ones. Interstellar space has lots of loose particles zipping around called cosmic rays. It's a terrible name because they're particles, not rays. Those particles are moving really fast and occasionally smash into big elements. And the little pieces that break off are sometimes lithium and beryllium. Lots of great questions this time. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.